Hello there and welcome to the English Language Club. It's Tuesday again, so it's time for our weekly hangout. I uh, hope you can see us. Um, give us a thumbs up if you can see us um, and, and if we're live. Um, uh, it'd be good to know things are working properly. Um, Tony, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? Great, yes. Um, I'm having some technical issues, though. Uh, no, no. It seems to be um, working. Bear with me. The stream open. It seems to be working. So okay. That's good. Great. Um, so, uh, yeah, let us. We had a few people watching already. AJ, I saw AJ there and Susanta. Um, I just need to get back onto the right screen because I I lost it when I went live. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Let, if you uh, have we got any questions yet? Uh, get the questions coming in. Um, have we got any questions yet, Tony? Can you see? Uh, no, I don't think we have any questions yet. Okay. Yeah. So, well, while we're waiting, yeah, get those questions coming in. And while we're waiting, okay. um, I guess we can give an update as to what we're planning for the course um, uh, Inside English. Uh, okay. So we are planning for that to launch uh, in um, January. Uh, yeah. Beginning of January, uh, we, we we've got it we've got it more or less ready. But we just want to really make sure the website's working okay, and then we want to kind of do some kind of a, a launch, uh, not event, but a launch. Um, uh, lots of events, really. So yeah. we're planning. We're planning. We've been doing these weekly live streams for over six months now, okay. um, and uh, we've really enjoyed doing it. And we've got. I think we've got a bit better at doing it, um, and I think um, people are people are in, enjoying them more as well. So, what we really want to do is, uh, kind of as an experiment, in January, is to just do a lot more of them. Um, um, maybe, well, as many as we can, as many as we can squeeze in. Uh, so, we're planning to uh, reach out to some other teachers and get so we can get some uh, guests involved. Um, and and we're also going to be uploading a lot more more videos, which Tony and I are working on writing now. So, um, yeah, great. So I'm I am back in now. Uh, things are working properly. I can see the see the back end. Okay, great. Okay. Oh, we've got some people in on face uh, on Facebook as well as on as well as on YouTube. So we've got a we've got a uh, compliment on your beard. Uh, uh, how do we say that? Anur, Anur says, uh, "My man with a great beard." <laughs> um, let's see. Which one of us, uh, us is that? Do you think? Sorry. Which one of us is that? Do you think that he's referring to? Mm, probably you. I think I have got a little bit of uh, thing uh, beard today. Not really. Not really a beard. <laughs> I'm not as, as not as I'm not as clean shaven as I I would like to be. But see, many <laughs> many people would say that is exactly the best kind of beard. So. It's all it's all up to uh, what one's all, preferences are. Yes, it's all subjective. Yes, uh, which is not the same as subjective, which is what subjunctive. Sorry, I think that's what. Yeah, that's what AJ means. Yeah. Not subjective, subjunctive. Yeah, what is a subjunctive? Yeah, so Tony. subjunctive is something. Uh, it's a. It's kind of like a different tense. Isn't the right word, but just like how tense changes the way you say a verb. Um, there's another thing that's often called uh, mood uh, that changes how you say the the verb. And so we say things that are like just reality, uh, or we say things that are kind of uh, a question, or we say things that are kind of a wish or uh, imaginary. Uh, that's what subjunctive is. So if you if you say something like "If I were you," that's the subjunctive uh, because it's not real. It's a it's a hypothetical. It's an imaginary situation. Um, or when you say, I wish that I had a million dollars, uh, that's you, the re you might be wondering, why do you say had there? Are you wishing, you know, that it was in the past that you had a million dollars or you, you wish that you had a million dollars right now? The answer mm -hmm. is because that's the subjunctive and it changes the way you say a verb slightly. Um, and it's, it's kind of complicated and messy, but in English, in some languages, the subjunctive is really uh, well-defined and it's clear and you use it for specific things in English. It's not uh, It's not super clear and it's not something we use a whole lot um, 
not like uh, it doesn't like just go with an if then question or something like that. Uh, but yeah, so it, it's a it's a way of saying a verb so that it represents an imagined reality or like a hypothetical, not actual. Mm. Reality. Like if mm. I were you, or I wish I had a million dollars. Yeah. Whenever I think about this kind of thing, I always think of that scene in the movie Back to the Future Two, where the doc is explaining how they've gone into an alternate timeline, and he's he writes on the on the blackboard and he shows the timeline going into an alternate reality. Yes, I, yes. I always think of that. Um, That's the subjunctive reality. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Great. So another question from Facebook this time. Sankar on Facebook says. Um, what are participles? Presumably uh, past participle and present participles. Is that what you mean? Uh, but yeah, that must be, I presume that's what he means. Uh, so yeah. great question. That really ties in with um, Inside English, the co our course. Um, although we don't, we don't dwell on, on this a huge amount, or we do, but, but we definitely do mention present participles and past participles. So yeah, yeah do you want to go in? Do you want to talk about that? So, um, actually, part, part, participles are one of my very favorite uh, concepts in, in grammar, not just in English, but in the way that language works. Uh, okay. And so I, I can't, that's part of the problem for me is I can't get into all of the things that I love about participles. But yeah, we've only got an hour, so. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I could, I could teach a course on this. But uh, a participle, the, the core down to what a participle is, is it's a verb form that can be used as an adjective, right? Uh, so there's two forms of a participle mm. in English. There's others in other languages. Um, the ing, which is the present participle, like uh, talking, and there's the um, the the ed or something with an in, uh, which is the past participle. So um, taken, uh, yeah. So uh, or um, uh, let's see, yeah. Now uh, it does get confusing tired. because because we have the past simple form of a verb, yes, but past is simple is also yeah, and that's that's also the name of a tense. But with all regular verbs that end with ed, the past simple form is also is the same as the past participle form. Yes. So it gets confusing because things overlap and things have in uh, things have inconsistent names. So you know the past simple form. Past simple is also a tense, but it's also used to refer to the form of the verb. But past participle is not a tense. It's just right. the form of the verb. So that's right. things get confusing there because things of the terminology. Yes. Mm. So to go to use the example of the present participle, um, so running, you can say, you can use that, like, you know, um, uh, my car is running. You're describing your car. It's working, right? Um, or uh, this, this uh, did you see that running man? earlier, like you're describing the person, right? Uh, so mm. because you can use that form as an adjective, that is a participle. You don't only use it as an adjective. Uh, you can use it in other ways, like we use it in the continuous tenses, right? Like the man was running. Uh, you can use it sometime um, as, as a, a noun, not running, but there are other ones that you could use as a noun. But that's the key you can tell yourself, okay, is this verb a participle? Is could I use it as an adjective. If you could use it as an adjective, then it's a participle. And in English, we mainly use them as adjectives or as um, uh, part of a, a verb, like we use them as the if it's a present participle, we use them as part of a continuous verb. Um, if, we, if it's a past participle, we use it as part of a perfect verb. And also we use them to, uh, to talk about uh, someone that we don't really know much about or something, uh, like, um, the man living next door. You're you're talking about uh, you're describing that man, um, or you could also say, uh, you know, uh, did you see that man? Who the one living next door? So that's a, a good example of a participle being used as a, a kind of a name for something. Uh, but they're mm. they're really interesting. They've got lots of different uh, kind of niche uses, uh, and so I, I'm I love participles. They're very very interesting. In English, it's particularly frustrating because they're very similar to gerunds. Uh, yeah. especially the ing form can also be a gerund, and that's when you use specifically use that ing form as the name of that action. 
like I like running. Running is a noun referring to that action. It's the name of that action. And that's yeah. Jared. And so you know that you know it's not the verb in that sentence because I like so like is the like exactly. is the verb in that sentence. Yeah. 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 So it's confusing that we have the same form of a verb can be either the present participle or a gerund um, or it can be or a past participle can also be the past simple form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Things get confusing because because. Yeah, of that. there is. There are some deep reasons because uh, why this is the case that are far back in history, like further back in history than written language even. Uh, but we but there there are reasons for it. Mm. And well, I think I think we'll have to we'll have to save that for another oh, another time. We, we can do and we can do that would be a good uh, video to to do a whole sort of history of participles and <laughs> if you like if you like <laughs> maybe uh, it'd be pretty complicated. Uh, uh, well, not so, maybe yeah yeah. So we'll yeah, because so so like because like I said, we are working on some scripts and working on some yes. new videos, and we're hoping to have uh, quite a few videos coming out in January and. Then beyond that, we're hoping to get into more of a flow where we get more regular uploads. Um, these past uh, few months, we've been focusing on writing a course, which is the first few modules are done now. Uh, so we, ha we have been busy, but none of that is actually live yet. Um, so apart from the live streams that we've been doing, um, not a lot has gone out, but we have been busy and you will get to see that in January. Um, yeah. So another question here from Peter03. He says, hello, sometimes it seems to me that when some words start with the a ah sound, it's pronounced more like uh, ah, as in arrogant. Um, and when the symbol is in the middle of a word, it's pronounced different, like bat or cat. OK, so I don't think it is pronounced differently. It is. I mean, OK, there may be a slight difference, but it's still coming under that phoneme, the, the ah phoneme, yes. um, arrogant, cat, back. It's all still ah, 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 arrogant, back, cat. Right. Um, so one thing yeah. to remember with these different sounds is that they are not one sound. All hmm. Sounds, especially vowel sounds, are like this long spectrum, like the electromagnetic spectrum or, or whatever. And <laughs> different sounds on there represent a section of it, right? So yeah. there could be, uh, the you know, the people who made IPA could be looking at different languages and they could come up with 30 different sounds that different people use that they group hmm. together under ah, the ah yeah. sound. So there is variation within that. And this is good. Um, this is this is uh, this is how languages work. We our ears are actually much better at picking up different sounds uh, when they're sounds we're used to, not when they're sounds in a different language that we aren't used to. Uh, than even like uh, computers are, or that uh, that we can create you know particular symbols to represent. So that's okay. Um, yeah. So there's there's variation. The other possibility is, uh, Colin, do you think uh, that Peter is talking about the the symbol? The uh, the ash symbol, the ae symbol, because that one can be pronounced differently. It's not necessarily the the letter, or the the ah um, sound. So Peter, let us know if you're talking about the ah sound, or if you mean the little symbol, the ae symbol. Yeah. So, but you, do you mean? I mean, within a IPA, mm -hmm. the ah sound is is. I mean, the the ash symbol is. Always the ah or something close to ah, um, but right. yeah, it, it, the, if that's what Peter is yeah. asking about the IPA symbol or if it's about yeah. um, because again we've been we've been working on some scripts and one of the scripts that we we've been working on is one on this ash symbol because yes. it's come up it's come up this is the third week in a row that we've had a question on 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 this and this yeah. is why we decided to do a video on it because it, of all the symbols in the IPA. The ash symbol is used is 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 used in other lots of different things. Many other things, yeah. Many other things. So it it creates some it has created some confusion of people okay. saying that's not how you pronounce this sound. In I know because we use it in my language, Danish or whatever. It's like yeah, I so, know, but but we're using we're using it in a different way. Yeah. We're using so it, if you yeah. if you are talking about the ah sound as in the IPA symbol. 
um, then you put it in in uh, slashes, right? So slash, then the act sound, uh, symbol, the ash symbol, and then another slash, so that we know yeah, that that's, that's how sound. that's how it's norm normally done. In our videos, we sort of have a slightly different a system: green background the, or a red background, the, green depending background. on whether it's vowel. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It would, yeah. But you can't type green background. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. So let right. us know if that answered your question, Peter, or if uh, we need to. Um, let us know if you were talking about the app sound or the, the symbol. Hmm. So let's quick. We've got another question from Sankar. I think this might be a follow up. Uh, I'm not sure. Being being jumped on a horse, I moved quickly as I used here. Can I use having jumped? He moved. And this is absolutely yes. You cannot say being jumped on a horse, I moved quickly, but you can say having jumped on a horse, on a horse, I moved quickly or he moved quickly. And this is this is getting into one why I love participles so much is because even from their very basic usage, uh, they they expand out to being able to be used for a lot of different things. This is an example mm -hmm. of one that you don't hear very often in spoken English, which is why I don't like teaching it. Um, I would teach I would teach this at a more of an advanced level, so like at a grade twelve course um, after having taken you know three years of English previous to that uh, for <laughs> writing a fancy essay or writing a story or something like that. People don't talk like this. No one says, "Having jumped on a horse, I was able to move very quickly." Um, well, some people do. I mean. I do occasionally, but most people <laughs> don't. But it can it can make your writing very fancy. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, the correct way to say this would be having jumped um, on a horse, not being jumped. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. So Usman says hello, sir. Hello to you. Hello. Um, Lolly, Lolly's here. Hello, Lolly. Uh, and uh, I think you had a question. Oh no, no, it's Susanta. Susanta's got a question. Don't hesitate about your English. Is this sentence correct? Hmm. So don't hesitate about your English. That's not really that's, correct, is it? What? I think it's probably okay in the sense that, like, someone's going to understand what you mean, but I'm not sure what the exact collocation. Don't, I would yeah, hear, so, I just because don't hesitate, hesitate. hesitate means to wait, mm -hmm. right? Or, or to, well, I think to wait because case, you're not sure. Be nervous. I think yeah, in, that's in what I think. Mean. So, and you would say, "Don't be nervous about your English," which is why I think that might be okay here. Um, yeah, it's just it just sounds strange to me. Don't hesitate. Yeah, I mean, hesitate. You'd maybe more use in, like, "Don't hesitate in your English." But that doesn't sound mm. that sounds even less right. Um, don't hesitate with your English. Uh, doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, uh, so, I mean, I would say something like, you know, "Don't don't worry about your English," or "Don't." Yeah feel bad or feel self-conscious about your English abilities um, or don't hesitate when speaking English. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think I feel like hesitate here is being used for something that's a little uncommon. Um, yeah. At least in American English, it might be different in, in, in British prongs. Uh, but I, yeah. Yeah, great. So question here from AJ. Any tips about writing uh, words that sell. So, if you're a salesman, if you've got any tips for sales salesmen, I actually, I actually have several. Um, oh, good. Writing tips, uh, uh, writing words specifically, if you're writing like a pitch or you're writing ad copy. Um, now, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm good at this because it kind of goes against my. It, it, it's not um, necessarily my natural talents. Uh, though I will say, what I do is, if you're excited about something, make sure that that comes out in your writing, and people who read it will be excited about it. Uh, so, but that's that's what I would say. Your my tips would be, be be positive, be be upbeat, um, be people say assumptive. So assume that someone is going to like it as much as you do, and and go with that. So don't don't mm. say things like you know if you want this, but more like since this is something everyone needs, right? So assume that someone already wants what you're what you're selling. That would be my 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 uh, mm. simple tip. Yeah, and my uh, my only tip that I would add is that um, when you're you don't sell the product, 
directly, but sell the 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 dream or the vision or the lifestyle that that, that product uh, can can bring you. Uh, if you think about car yes. adverts, you know, the cars are often not the main the main character of the of the advert. It's the person, you know, and it's always it's sort of they always have people that the kind of people that we aspire to be, you know. So um, that that's that's kind of how I think effective advertising and, and marketing works. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great. Okay, let's see. Uh, we've got a few uh, vocabulary runs from Susanza here. Um, what does the word technocrats mean? In they are technocrats. Yeah, what is a technocrat? So technocrat. This is a really good example of a, a word that someone made up a long time ago, uh, and and it stuck because they followed the rules of how English words work, mm -hmm. right? Um, so a crat, it it comes from uh, you know for for like a monarchy. Um, uh, Democrats, um, aristocrat, uh, it's a person affiliated with a certain kind of rule. Um, and like a, yeah, a monarch. Uh, techno from techno technology, right? So a technocrat is someone who rules through technology, right? Uh, mm. And so technocrats are people that either have a technological advantage or use technology to influence. Um, People like um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg, Thanks. Elon Musk, um, even like Bill Gates, uh, Steve Jobs would not be one. Jeff Bezos, again, maybe, maybe if you're more on the business side of it, you you may or may not be a technocrat, like because people like um, hmm. those ran tech companies. So some people would call them a technocrat, but they were not themselves necessarily as much tech people. As for instance, with Steve Jobs, like Steve, like uh, Wozniak, right? Yeah. Um, whereas someone like Bill Gates, or uh, like that's the perfect example, like someone who is incredibly good with technology and is incredibly um, successful and incredibly influential, that's a technocrat. I, I think someone like Jeff Bezos would also count, but it's a bit of a different um, spin to it. But someone who has incredible influence through technology um, is a technocrat. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks for that question. Uh, we got now, another. We, we got a few. Before we go on with uh, Susanna's yeah. question, she's got great questions, but I want to go up because we did. I don't know if we necessarily missed it. Uh, maybe oh, I missed one. We talked about it. Um, well, Peter 003 had a second comment uh, after after their question, um, which was, uh, "Will it be possible to share yeah, video with you or just sound in the future? Because it would be easier to explain how I pronounce the ah. words." Uh, yes. So this is actually something we've definitely we've been talking about doing, and we're definitely planning on doing this at least starting in January. We might find time to do one uh, in December, uh, but definitely in January, uh, yes. we're going to start doing. Uh, Colin, do you want to talk about the our Zoom meetings? I know some people have been um, really eagerly awaiting these. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we've we, we've been talking about doing Zoom meetings, and it's definitely something we want to do, and that's going to be one of the. The perks of the um, membership um, of yeah. the YouTube, the YouTube membership. Um, now, I'm, it's going to technically be the highest level membership, but f at least for the whole month of January, we're going to we're going to make it open to anyone from any any level because we don't have that many members, to be honest. So uh, that the, you know, and, and if there's nobody there, there's it's there's no point in doing it. So. Um, and, and the more people that are there, the more value that it has up up to a certain point. So until we've got, um, yeah, we'll, we'll 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 keep it open to all uh, members of of the English Language Club channel um, uh, until there's too many, and then we'll sort of limit it to the higher higher levels. So in in case you're you're not sure what I'm talking about with the, with the members, if you look underneath the the video next to the subscribe button. You should see a join button if you're watching on YouTube. This is, uh, and if you click on that join button, it'll show you that there's three levels of membership. Um, the first level is is basically just um, you, you get to it, it's just basically just showing your support for us, and we really appreciate that. Uh, you do get uh, if you see if you look at Lolly Lolly, she's one of our members, and so she has a special little logo 
next to her name uh, and also um, Gaspar as well. Uh, Gaspar's is red because he's been a member long longest. He was one of our very, very first members. Um, Lolly Lolly joined uh, about a month ago uh, during a live stream, which was nice. So I, I remember that very well. Um, uh, so yeah, if you are a member, you, you'll get access to some Zoom calls uh, starting at least in January. May, maybe we might squeeze one or two in beforehand. Um, so we're so, yeah, very much looking that... forward to that so that you can, yeah, you can say a word, we can go over pronunciations and we can talk about things and hear your questions from you. Yeah, we're very excited. Mm. And also, I just really want to get to know people better. Totally, yeah. Um, and we've, because... some, of you, some of you, we've been talking to you and answering your questions for, for you know, most of the last year, right? Yeah. And yeah, exactly. And I, it's so it's so weird. Like, we all, we just see the little thumbnail, and and YouTube doesn't give us any way to kind of get in touch with you or anything like that after after the um, after the the live stream. So it'd be great to be able to talk. Um, kind of face to face and get to know you better. And also, I feel like everyone is everyone here wants to improve their English. But I know that improving English, you know, being able to speak English is not gonna is not a fine. It's not a a goal. I mean, it is a goal, but it's not a, the it's final a goal. Yeah. It's a step. It's always a means to an end. So I want to get beyond beyond that. I want to find out why people want to learn English. And then try to be able to help them at that even deeper level, not the not just you know answer, not just answering questions about grammar and vocabulary and things, but you know um, maybe help putting them in touch with the right people and um, starting kind of starting a more of a community. Um, yeah. So yeah. So starting from January, uh, that'll that's going to be uh, starting. But you can join right away. And then you'll get uh, you should get notified when we start doing things. If you do join right away, you'll see what I have made a, a handful of uh, behind the scenes videos, which you'll get access to. And you'll also get access to you, you, you'll get the badge by your name and you also get some custom emojis, uh, which um, you can use in the chat. Uh, maybe Lolly Lolly can uh, show one of those if, if you're. If you're watching, post a comment with with the custom emoji. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, Gaspar's um, here too. So and get oh, all Gaspar. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Yes. So should we? Let's see. What's the next question? Um, ah, yeah. We got a few more from Suzanne. So, so here's one. Suzanne says, "What is a non-denial denial?" That's uh, this is a this is a, a thing that people say. Um, if, if, say, for instance, a politician gets accused of something and they, they give a denial, so they're saying, oh, no, I wasn't, but then in their speech, they don't ever actually explain why they, like, how you know they didn't do it. They mm. officially gave a denial, but they didn't really. And so someone might say, well, that was a non-denial denial, wasn't it? Um, right. It's like saying you're sorry without saying you're sorry. Yeah. So you Often people will say... I'm sorry that you were offended or I'm sorry right. that I caused offense, but they won't actually say that they're sorry for the thing they said. <laughs> so so <laughs> or, if, if I said that, then I'm sorry. Well, assume you, you, they kind of mean, well, I don't think I said that. Right. That's a, mm. a non, yeah. A non denial denial. Something like that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And another question from Susanta, the time was well overdue means what? So what does that mean? Tony? It's well, so, over, well, well overdue. Yeah, a due a due date is like when something has to be finished by, or or when it's a good by. So like uh, a carton of milk might have a due date that like beyond which you you wouldn't want to you couldn't sell it, for instance. So overdue means either you know you should have gotten that done a long time ago, or it's long past uh, when it's good for, right? So milk could be overdue, or an assignment that you're turning into school could be overdue, right? Hmm. So if someone if someone's talking about a time being overdue, usually what they mean is that something has happened, some kind of an event, um, and the time for this, like it should have happened a long time ago, right? Like, um, uh, yeah, it, yeah. So like a train, a train has a due is due at a certain time, and right. if it's late, you could say it's well uh, it's well overdue. Yes, would mean it's or, very late, very late. And this is kind of as a. Um, 
think we talk about this as like kind of often big cultural things. Like someone will say, well, you know, uh, the time is well overdue for us to have uh, a woman prime minister or um, the time is well overdue for us to, uh, you know, end our grievance with this with this other group or uh, the time is well overdue yeah. to have improved equality or rights or, or whatever. They talk about big grand things. It's like, you know, this mm. should have happened a long time ago. It's yeah. the time is well overdue. Yeah. yeah. But also I, I feel like the, we, we'd normally say not the time is well overdue, but the thing is overdue. Well, that's, so, that's why I think I, it's referring to these big things. That's where yeah. I would hear someone say, oh, uh, right, well yeah, the time, yeah, for this. That specific yeah. phrase, yeah. So, Most of the time, so we the just time say overdue. is overdue for big things. But if it's right. talking about the, a train being late, you the say train the train is overdue, is overdue. this milk is yeah. overdue, my essay yeah. is overdue. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Right. In fact, overdue yeah. is even can be one word. Um, it's a, mm. but not as yeah. phrase. Yeah. Hmm. That's a big okay. question. So Santa always has these very interesting questions coming from news programs. It's, uh, yeah. It's very exciting. And uh, here's another one from Susanta. Uh, what does could be top of the table mean in sport in a sports context? So is this, so, a, yeah. Go is this a British saying? Because I would sit here, like in, in the US English, we would say head of the table. Oh right. Well, no, yeah, top of okay, that's British English then. Top uh, of the yeah, table. top yeah, top okay, of the I table. Possibly. Like so you have a, a league table if you've got lots of teams, football teams playing uh in a league and they win they get a certain number of points if they win a match or a certain number if they draw a match. Um and then then they move up and down in the table. It doesn't mean table like you you sit on. Like, or, no, you don't sit on a table, but you, you sit, sit at right. you sit at the table. Uh, but a, a, a table can also mean like a a way of organizing information, a chart, um, a graph. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's referring to that. Um, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, but you could put yeah, any, we, you could put any information on it. Well, not any information, but lots of types of information on a table. We were talking about uh, train times. So you could have a timetable. Trains might have a timetable. Um, and yes. that's the same kind of table as you'd have in sports. <laughs> it's um, like a spreadsheet. Yeah. Look, yeah. Yeah, Great. I think in, in US, uh, Canadian, I, um, I'm not as necessarily up on all sports terminology, um, but uh, I think they would call this a bracket. I don't, you don't usually use them referring to table. In the sports con, on t like what you're talking about, they call it a bracket. Um, more often, I think a bracket in, is more specific, a specific part of the table. Well, maybe so, but I'm I'm saying like uh, you don't see this phrase used like talking okay. about the table of a mm. um, of a of a sports league. They don't they don't talk about the table. Um, they they might talk about the bracket, but I I, I haven't heard. Um, yeah, I haven't heard people talking about the table of a sports league for, say, hockey in Canada or or uh, football in the in the U.S. or anything like that. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Okay. So we got uh, one more for now. I think there's some more from Susanna coming up later. Uh, she says, "How to use the word regardless? Regardless. Um, I mean, like you was. I mean, it means the same thing roughly as anyway." Uh, like he knew it was dangerous, but he did it regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, he did it anyway, right? Yeah. Um, you can also use the word without regard, which is mm -hmm. similar, uh, but you don't use it the same way um, as anyway. You give the reason. Like he did it without regard for the danger. You could also say he did it regardless of the danger, right? So you can mm -hmm. use regardless either to mean anyway or kind of without regard or, or despite. Um, what you want to be careful not to do is say irregardless, um, because regardless already means without thinking about it, without worrying about it. So ear like would be opposite, uh, it means without, would be without, without thinking. And that's a double negative, which we don't really do in English. Uh, so a lot of people will say irregardless, but do not say irregardless. <laughs> that's one of those common, common mistakes. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's see. Uh, okay, uh, moving on to a question from Lolly Lolly. Uh, please, what's the difference between shadow and shade? 
I think we might have talked about this one a long time ago. Really? So this uh, is a good question because yeah, it great really question. Gets into the, the nuance mm. of how words are used differently, even though they mean almost the same thing. Yeah, yeah they are. If they effective, like from a phys physics point of view, yeah, they are the same, right? The same thing. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, that is in shadow. So, um, you say there's a you're in a big a big field and there's a building in this field. Uh, you can from, when you're looking at it from far away, you say, "Oh well, I can see the shadow of the building stretching out across the field." But if you were going to say, "Oh, I want to go sit down where the sun isn't going to shine on me," we would say, "Oh, let's go sit in the shade." Not, I mean, you could say, well, "Let's go sit in the shadow of that building," which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're talking about the area that's in shadow, we, we just call it the shade. So like mm. I was I, I stayed under the tree because I wanted to be in the shade, right? Technically you're in the, sh the tree's shadow, but since you're talking about it as an area, you call it uh, the shade. Yeah, yeah. So it when you talk about a shadow, you're talking you're kind of talking about the thing that makes the shadow. In or you're way. talking about the shadow as if it were a thing, right? Yeah. Like you can yeah. see the shadow stretching off along the ground, right? You're talking right. about that as a thing as opposed to the area inside it, yeah. which is the shade. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. That's a, that's a uh, cool question. I like it. Mm. Let's, so another one from uh, uh, Sankar in, on Facebook. Oh, on Facebook. Uh, where, do we have, where do we have to use being or having? Is there any rules? Are there any rules? Being or having? Being or having. Um, uh, so this is the same. You're the same. This is the same. Uh, talking about the uh, the participles. Mm. Um, so yeah, specifically as participles body. or in in uh, in verbs. Um, yeah, yeah. I think we need to we need some examples maybe and some clarification on what you mean there, Sankar. So uh, please let us know and we'll get back to you. Well, we'll, 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 well get to that. They did give us the, the, the previous example, which was, how do you know that you say uh, having jumped on a horse as opposed to being jumped on a horse? Um, in this particular case, uh, if you're going to use jumped, uh, which is the, um, the uh, past participle, uh, you have to use have because the verb, the, the auxiliary verb have goes with past participles and the auxiliary verb be goes with present participles, right? So having jumped, um, then, but if it was with a present participle, you, you, would, you would use be. So being jumping, but that's really unusual. Uh, being jumping doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? Um, I mean, you could, I think, you, uh, I, I can't really think of a good example of where you would use that. Uh, but that's that's the difference when you would use being and having there as participles is having would go with a past participle so having jumped having already eaten um, having taken out the trash um, having studied all day right those are all past participles being mm. you would use with a present participle great quick shout out to uh Palur paluri who's got who, who has a very similar question so i think we've answered that as well so thank you for that question paluri as well that's great um so suzanne says uh, another another thing from suzanne you've already commented on this tony in the in the chat um engaged, well, question, so. ah, right so engaged in hell mary plan what does this mean i heard this but no idea what was said, uh, I could be wrong. So, uh, so. Um, I, I assume that what you heard was a Hail Mary as opposed to Hell Mary. Um, and this mm. is a is an idiom that references um, the, the Hail Mary prayer, the Ave Maria. Um, that, uh, and so the idea of something that is a Hail Mary means it's, it's a long shot. You're just doing it, hoping that it works. Uh, so a plan can be a Hail Mary plan, which means it's just kind of your your last effort. Like you hope it works, and if it doesn't work, it's going to be a disaster. But if you're talking about sports, you were early talking about earlier talking about sports. In American football, there's a specific hail mary play, um, and uh, so that refers to where the the person throwing the ball will just throw it as far as they can into the scoring zone, uh, and 
hope that someone on their team can catch it. Uh, they're not throwing mm -hmm. it to someone, they're just throwing it out to the, the scoring area and hoping that someone can catch it. So that's that's kind of what the phrase Hail Mary means. Like a long shot. It's a long shot. Uh, you don't really know if it's gonna work or not. Uh, you just kind of hope it works out. You're not yeah. heading for a specific target. You're just kind of hoping it works out. Okay, great. We've got another question here uh, from Azraf. He says, uh, sir, please, how can I speak fluent English? Mm. So, um, yeah, any tips on fluency, how to improve fluency? So yeah. I'll, I'll explain, first of all, on, on the one hand, you've got accuracy, and on the other hand, you have fluency. And I, and I know when I was sort of training to teach English, um, some you, you would, you're either going to be focusing on one or the other as a teacher. So if you're focusing on fluency, you're not going to constantly correct people when they make little mistakes. But if you're focusing on accuracy you'd normally be focusing on one particular uh, aspect in that lesson. And so you would then be correcting them on that. Um, but generally as a lesson goes on, you, 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 you transition from, from accuracy to fluency as you allow people to sort of be more free. But, ge so, but generally, yeah, fluency, how to be more fluent is, is just don't, don't worry about making mistakes. We sort of talked about this earlier when we were talking about being hesitant. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about making mistakes. Just try to express yourself. Uh, but it is hard. It's not to say it's easy. It is hard. Um, but uh, yeah, you you sort of yeah. Don't be hesitant. Don't don't uh, don't be shy. Um, just try to express yourself. Um, yeah. Any other any other Absolutely. anything to add to that? I do want to add one thing and then I want to, to kind of take that a bit further. Uh, so mm. fluency means different things depending on what you are doing. If you yeah. are delivering a business proposal to a to a company uh, that is, uh, you know, an, an, from an English speaking country, you're what you're going to be required to do is, is very different. Maybe you need to uh, be very accurate and precise and use formal language. But if you are um, you know, chatting with people about sports, uh, or you are, uh, you know, a tourist and you're you're trying to see the sights. Then that doesn't matter. Uh, so what I would focus on, unless you unless you are like you have presentations to give, uh, you just want to be able to speak to people in in English. Then what I would focus on is, you know, focus on making sure you're pronouncing your words so that other people can understand you. But don't worry about your accent. Think about, you, you wanna make sure that you're pronouncing it so that people yeah. can understand, but you don't need to worry about your, your accent. Just make sure people understand you. Don't worry about getting everything right. Just worry about being confident enough and, and speaking um, to people. People are gonna be way more likely to uh, take the time to, to understand you if you're actually talking to them and making mistakes, as opposed to if you're hesitantly stumbling, you know, you say a couple of words and then you're like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get this right. Um, I, had, I had a brother who used to do that. He would start over his uh, his sentences every time he made a mistake. And it was just impossible to, to understand what he was gonna say because he never got past the first parts of his sentence. So just don't worry about making a mistake, just bulldoze on ahead. Uh, yeah. and, and you can always correct yourself afterwards, but you have to get your basic message across or nobody's going to be able to understand you doesn't matter how how and good also you, you, you can always look for or even ask for signs of understanding oh you yes saying do you know what i mean uh, mm -hmm. you understand um yes. thing, things like yeah. that is is always helpful if you know you've made mistakes but you you know that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be understood because often right. context and body language all contribute and people will often uh, know what you mean and, and, and you can understand, check. say again. And, and you can always check that by asking yes. for yes. confirmation. And, yeah. and understand that native speakers don't speak flawlessly, mm. either because they're being informal or because they're excited or because they genuinely make mistakes. A normal dialogue doesn't sound like something out of a textbook. It's not yeah. gonna use you know, proper grammar in every situation. You're going to have contractions, uh, even contractions that don't exist. Um, you're going to have, you know, people shortening and 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 over glossing things. So 
native speakers are completely used to understanding something that is not perfect. That is yeah. the normal to be able to understand mm -hmm. something that's not perfect. So you do not have to be perfect to be 100% understood, right? So do, to let that be a confidence build, it's more important to say what you have to say and then maybe go back and, and check, did you understand or make, make corrections if you made a mistake than it is to work really hard to get it perfect but not ever finish your thing that you're trying to say, right? Yeah, yeah. great. Okay, if you are just joining us, thank you very much for, for coming. And um, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the, the chat. That's what we're here for. We don't really uh, have anything planned for these sessions. Uh, these Hangout sessions are all about just answering the questions that you give us uh, during the stream. So uh, keep them keep them coming in. Uh, we've got one here from uh, Win Sang. I think hope that's hope I pronounced that right. Uh, it says how to use the word rejection. So rejection is the noun form of to reject. Uh, so so how do we use that? When when would we use the reject in the noun form rejection? Um, so when you're talking about uh, when someone has rejected you or rejects something, uh, like, you know, some people have trouble dealing with reject rejection. When they're rejected, they have a hard time dealing with it. Um, you might talk about a rejection slip or a rejection letter. So if you applied to a university and they said, no, you didn't qualify, that's a rejection letter or it's just a rejection. So like I've been applying to so many universities and I've gotten so many rejections, right? Mm. Or or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so it, but it can be so it can be a noun to refer to a specific rejection from a specific university right. or job application or something. Um, but it can also you can also feel rejected. Uh, you can feel rejection. Would you say? Um, Yes, you can feel rejection, like, uh, or you can, like, you can, for instance, when I said he's bad at dealing with rejection, like, that just means all rejections, or you yeah. can say, um, I'm afraid so in, of rejection, like, as in, I feel like my, my friends are rejecting me, and I'm, I'm mm. afraid of that feeling, right? So it has a wider co context, yes. it can have a wider context other than some, a specific job or specific, yes. um, uh, yeah, application, um, it, it can just mean any 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 conversation. Yes. You could get rejected any in any conversation if you. And try this is something that happens. Them. Yeah, like when you're trying to talk to someone in a, in a in a different language than your first language, and you come up and you you maybe you make a mistake and you and you pull out back, then you feel like you were rejected from the conversation, which you may or may not have been, but the mm. feeling of rejection is still there, right? Yeah, yeah. To sort of tie that in with the previous question about yeah. fluency. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, a few more hellos. Hello to uh, Mediuma. Mediuma, hello. And uh, let's see, uh, English Journey with uh, Linia. Hello to you. And uh, Mah 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 Mahmoudul in Bangladesh. Hello to you. Um, okay, question here from Mediuma. Uh, can you explain how to use modal verbs? And when it's formal and in an informal request. So modal verbs, good subject, big subject. Yes, big subject, very important. <laughs> um, so we talked about this. We've, um, it depends on if you're asking for permission or if you're asking someone to do something for you. So um, like we've talked about may or can. Formally, if you're asking for permission, you should say may. You know, may I introduce? Uh, myself in an informal position you never say may you say can uh, in fact this is so much that it's a joke that people will say uh, um, can I uh, can I help you and someone will say I don't know can you because technically <laughs> can refers to are you able to yeah um, but but we use it in informal situations uh, to ask for permission as well right uh, whereas for formal you kind of have to stick with may um, then if you're, if you're asking someone to do something, again, we've talked about this in English, in, you're polite when you do things, when you ask for things indirectly. So you can say, you know, pass the salt, that's very direct. Uh, but if you say, uh, 
you know, would you pass the salt or can you pass the salt or do you mind passing the salt? Um, or if you could, please pass the salt. Uh, so some of those are, are modals, like would, could, can. Um, mm. And and again, the more inform or the more uh, indirect, indirect it is, yeah. the more kind of polite it is. Uh, and then for formal can be different things. Like in some cases, a formal thing would be like uh, you know the uh, the head of an organization you know issuing you know commands uh, instructions to people under them. They wouldn't be super polite. They wouldn't be out of the way. If you would please do this. Uh, they would just say do it. So formal can mean different things, but if you're talking about polite, yeah, the more the more indirect uh, when you're making a request, the more polite it is. Mm. Great. Okay. Um, so I think I missed one here actually. I think I missed this one from Mary Mary Umer as well. Uh, getting through. Can you explain this sentence, please? I haven't understood her meaning getting through so to get so to get through to someone um yeah so this is a great sort of phrasal verb yes um so to it's yeah so to get through means uh to, to be to be understood or to get someone's attention that would yes. be w one one meaning but remember phrasal verbs can have more than one meaning um or, so that's kind of the and, and there'll often be like a literal meaning to get yeah. through something you know i want yeah. to get through this traffic i want to uh you know the the, the builders need to get through a wall <laughs> or right. um you, and, you know, and then there's the next one which is kind of similar to that but it's more abstract just like i need to get through the day right you're not yeah. literally passing through or like i need to get through these this paperwork Right, you yeah, just you're not you're not physically passing through something, but you are going. Well, sometimes you want time. to physically pass through your paperwork. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so getting through, uh, yeah. Uh, so several, a couple of different meanings, but I think it's more commonly used as in metaphorically to mean to get someone's attention, to get yes. through to someone, or to get a, a specific message through to someone. Um, yeah, great. Um, so Annabella, hello. Um, can you explain? Sorry, where did I get that from? Can you help me to use two and four? Thank you. So two and four. Uh, when would these be similarly? Um, okay, so if you're it's helpful about... with, with questions like this, Annabelle. It's helpful. It's helpful if you can give us some examples, uh, right. because we're having to think. Yes, I know that those two words can be because those two words are used in lots of different contexts. Lots of different contexts. Um, so we're trying to think. Okay, what is the context where they're easily confused? And that's so, difficult to do on the spot. But if you give us an example, it'll be much easier. <laughs> so my guess would be like where these are are often like, often confused is when you're talking about the reason you did something. Um, like I came here to help, um, mm. or I came here for eggs, right? Uh, both of those say why you came here. Um, yeah. but and so actually I was talking about this last week and I, and I didn't have necessarily a, a good example to hand. So this is something, um, that we call, talk, call like, you know, purpose and defect or cause and purpose. Um, and, uh, so that refers to like so you know I came here to help. That was your that was your intention, like coming into it, like what you wanted to accomplish, your your goal, right? Uh, I came here in order to help. Helping is is the is my in, my desire. I came here for eggs is like what you you want to bring out of the situation, the kind of the end result that you're hoping for. I came here to get eggs and bring them home with me, right? Uh, so, so that's one way. Two is sometimes used to refer to like your your reason going into something. Four is the the goal that you want out of it. I see you gave the example. I write to yeah. you, or I write for you. And now here, these are totally different things, and they mean completely different. Yeah, different in its context. Things. Yeah, in this context. Yeah. So here, two is that makes it the indirect object. Um, you, that's the person who's receiving the action, uh, or the 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 results of the action. Uh, so you're writing a letter, and you're sending it to someone. Uh, so 
Whereas I'm writing it for, that means you're on their behalf. So if you're writing to someone, they're not here with you. Because if they were, why would you be writing to them? You're writing something and then sending it to them. But if you're writing for someone, say there's someone who uh, they can't write or, or they're blind or their hands are full, and so you, they ask you, would you jot this down for me? And so you write for them. You're doing it on their behalf. Uh, so yeah, these in this case, they mean completely different things. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything great. to add to that? Colin? No, no. Um, that yeah, that's great. And thanks for thanks for giving those examples. That's yes. really helpful. We always um, appreciate the examples. <laughs> yeah. So another question here from uh, Win we, or Wien or yeah, I, I, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong. I apologize. <laughs> um, I think when we learn English, we should learn more about pronunciation than grammar. Is that right? Hmm. Well, it depends. It, de it depends. It, yeah. It depends on on you. Like you, you need to focus in on your weaknesses. So, if grammar is your weakness, then you need to focus more on that. If pronunciation is your weakness, then you need to focus more on that. Um, but I would, I would, I would think. I mean, textbooks generally have a lot more about grammar than they do about pronunciation. About pronunciation. Well, um, think of it. Think of it this way: if you can't pronounce the sounds. No one is going to understand you no matter what you say. But yeah. if you don't know the grammar, you won't be able to say anything. You can say words, you can say dog or that, <laughs> um, but you, yeah. can't, you can't make sentences. So, you, I mean, you can't, like, this is like, uh, yeah, you can't. I, I think at, at a very it. elementary level, I think vocabulary is more important than grammar. Because you can walk into a restaurant and say, "Table four, and the waiter will know what you want. You know, you right. know. Um, but you're very limited if that's it's very the limited. Yeah, you're working with. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's 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 sort of no grammar. That's just vocabulary. <laughs> exactly. Um, but wow. if you, you know, so um, you can make yourself understood with just the vocab with just the vocabulary and yeah. and not the grammar but the grammar will will help to make it more understood but if you're you know you have very poor pronunciation then i guess even if you know the words but you can't say them prop in a way that people will understand then uh yeah then that's going to be a problem too so you you know you need to assess your own strengths and weaknesses and to, totally. de to determine the answer to that question. So yeah. I, but I would say, generally speaking, that's not right. It's not yeah. right that pronunciation is more important than grammar. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it depends. Uh, I mean, could... yeah. yeah, I can't think of a good situation. Like, again, like if you, it, I can't think of a good situation where we're learning English, you need to learn more about pronunciation than grammar, just because there's a lot more grammar to know than there is pronunciation. Um, mm. Yeah. So, but again, you have to focus on both of these to a certain extent. Uh, but then, what you choose um, uh, to to focus on afterwards is going to be based on what you need, what your weaknesses are. Yeah. Okay. So we've got a question here from, sorry, this one uh, from Ziham. He he says, uh, "Hi, I asked you about uh, improvement of my writing." Uh, thank you. So, um, yeah, we, any tips on writing? We, we've, we've talked about, we have talked about this before in previous, previous yeah. episodes, but it's always, it's always an interesting one. In fact, I think, uh, Wynn has already, uh, or we Yen, or, or I don't know, <laughs> sorry, uh, has already, uh, uh, jumped in with a tip. You can read more English books. That's a good way to, to help with writing. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, what are the, what are your main the main points the main tips for for uh, uh, imp improving writing? And again, I mean, I I would say I can teach a course on this, but I have I've taught several, so it's <laughs> it, there's no real end to this. But some uh, it depends on what you're writing. If yeah. you're trying to write a college uh, a university entrance um, essay, like you're trying to apply, then what you're going to be doing is very different, and you have to do very formal writing. And the best thing to do is is really practice and, and work on that particular form of essay writing. Um, if you're trying to write, well, let's just pick something. Uh, you're trying to write posts on the internet, comments on YouTube videos, questions in chat rooms, uh, uh, forum posts, this kind of thing. Then what I, would, what I would focus on is with writing, accuracy is very important. Uh, whereas like 
confidence is not as important because you can take all the time you need to write it out. So once you've written something, go back and look at it and see if you can figure out what you may have missed or what mistakes you may have made. Because taking an extra, um, taking twice as long to write something and going back and double checking and finding your, your mistakes will make a lot more of a difference. Um, when you're talking, most of what you're saying, or a lot of what you're saying doesn't just come from the words. It comes from how you said it, it comes from what else is in the conversation. Um, and so, and again, uh, native speakers are very used to understanding things that are not perfect. But in writing, throw mm -hmm. that all out. If, if you make a mistake, someone might completely misunderstand what you were saying. Even if you didn't make a mistake, you might not realize that what you're saying sounds like something else. So that's probably my biggest tip for when you're writing is always, always, always take the time to go back over it and make sure it was what you wanted to say and that you didn't make any mistakes. I still do this. I have been speaking English all my life. <laughs> I've been teaching English for more than half my life. I, I write professionally. Uh, so, But I, every time I write something, um, even if it's like a text message or an email, especially if it's too, like if it's a business related thing, I always take time to go back over it again uh, yeah. because accuracy is more important in writing than, than in, in fact, Tony, Tony and I have been writing some things together recently. And so even after he's gone through it, we actually go through it together. Yes. Uh, and again, maybe not so much looking for mistakes, but, but looking for, uh better ways to to explain things and better ways to yeah. say things uh and that's fun doing that together it is, um, yeah. so yeah and, um, and don't now look at it always as like looking for mistakes that's good but also mm -hmm. look think of think not just did i are you expressing mistakes, yourself yeah. am i doing this am i saying what i want to say and can i say it in a better way that's yeah that's my number one tip go over what you write look for mistakes Check to see whether you're saying what you really want to say and whether you can say it better. I mean, don't don't spend 10 minutes on a sentence. Uh, you have to eventually let go and, and send it. But, but yeah, that I think can improve your writing a ton just by spending mm -hmm. time thinking about it. Because oftentimes we know more than we actually wind up putting out there. Like we might write a sentence and we made a mistake that if we really had thought about it, we would we knew that was a mistake and we could have fixed it. Uh, but we just didn't think about it when we were writing. Yeah. Great. That's a good okay. question. Yeah. Now, this question, um, I don't quite understand it, but maybe you will, Tony. I think uh, so. We'll, we'll figure it out. So, hello. Can you explain how to know if and is acting as a fanboy in a sentence? Because it's difficult for me to identify compound sentence from a simplex or other sentence when I found and in the uh, when, uh, in the middle, in the middle, yeah, added on there. Uh, right, I'm not okay. So this is this is I, I I have to admit I've never I've never heard this actually used. I've seen it in textbooks before, but I've never heard anyone actually use it. So a fanboy is a uh, is a, a a conjunction. So a fanboy stands for for and nor but, or, yet, and so, I think. So these are, these are um, coordinating conjunctions that we use to combine sentences together um, into a compound sentence. Uh, so one that doesn't have this, uh, and Kay is referring to it as a, a simplex. Um, I would call it a simple sentence, right? Uh, so the question is, how do you find and, how do you see whether and is connecting two sentences or is it connecting something else, right? And that is an excellent question. That is an excellent question. There is a really simple um, way of, of telling. Put, put your finger over the and and look and see if the two parts of the sentence would be able to be a sentence on their own. And that's it. Uh, if they are, then it's being used as a, as a um, coordinating conjunction, they say. Um, oftentimes it does you can make tell sense without if it and, does make sense. It's coordinating. If, if, if you could just cover it up and make it to two different sentences, then it's a compound sentence. Uh, if it's like, oftentimes it's easy to see if it's in a list, right? Like 
uh, I, I like um, uh, cheeseburgers, steak, and uh, chicken, uh, then yeah, you can tell that's pretty easy. But oftentimes it'll be in what is essentially a list, but it won't be immediately obvious. Hmm. Like I, took I went the to the shop out, and yeah. Well, yeah, I took the trash out and um, uh, brought the recycling to the street. Technically not a coordinating conjunction there. Because if you covered the and, you'd have, I took the trash out, that's a sentence, then brought the recycling brought to the, the recycling. street, not a sentence. So here you've got a, a one subject with two sentences uh, going after it. Yeah, But if mm. you can cover up that and and both sides make a sentence, then it's a coordinating. So let me know if that that helped you that's a good question yeah. great yeah um yeah i mean i've never heard that use of of fanboy uh that's so that's and like you say it's you it's not that's not a common common thing it's not yeah I've, I've seen it in textbooks before what is it for mm. and nor but or yet and so fanboys fanboys yeah. mm. fanboys yeah Great. Okay. Uh, Suzanne here. she might be just commenting on that. The word and is not as easy as I think it, as I think it is. It's yeah. So that's, I think that's tying in with that previous, previous speaking, comment. The more commonly word are used, uh, commonly used a word is, the more it's secretly sophisticated because it's been used for so many different things over time. Yeah, definitely true. That's why all the most common verbs are irregular or yeah. All, yeah. Yeah. All the most common verbs, yeah, have become irregular, yeah. Mm, mm. So here's a question from uh, Lap. Uh, how to mind our English without thinking, translating? So, you, yeah, so how do we sort of think in an, a language that's not our first language? That's the question here. Yeah. Um, um, do you have any tips? You, I, I can think of a hmm. few things. I don't know. I mean, it, I... For for me, when I was when I was living in South America and uh, speaking Spanish, I did sometimes get start thinking in Spanish, mm. um, but I'm not sure what it was that 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 caused me to that to do that. Or it, I think it just ha started happening at a certain certain point after a certain amount of exposure and immersion in in yes. the language. Um, yeah. You can kind of tell this, and this happens to to, um, to us sometimes, where you'll know a word in a different language, but you can't think of the word in, in your own language. And that's mm. kind of when you know you've kind of gotten that ability to to think original thoughts in yeah. another language instead of just thinking them in English first and translating them. One thing I would say is that many people will tell you you can't do this, and they are wrong. Anybody can learn to think in a different language if they know that language uh, sufficiently well. So that's the first thing is you don't, don't expect to start doing this right away when you're learning a new language. Some people can do it, some people it won't come naturally to. Uh, but if you've, once you've begun to learn a language really, really well, there are a few tricks that I've found work for some people. It's gonna be different for different people. Some people, um, the key was listening to music in their other language. Once you've listened to enough music that you've got the words to those songs going on in your head in that language, and you've, you've probably never translated those words into your language. You just enjoy listening to um, the words in, say, English, right? If you're listening to an English song. Uh, that will really help your brain get used to um, thinking in English as opposed to translating. Um, the same for like a really interesting or, or catchy movie or television show. Uh, if you can get it, it so that you're you're so kind of immersed in that world that you're thinking um, about the things that are in that show in English as opposed to in um, your your native language, that will help. And again, that's not going to work for everybody, but those mm -hmm. might be some some neat tricks: music, television, um, and then like Colin said, it's really just about immersion. The more yeah. time you're spending, like if you you know if you spend a couple of hours a day speaking to people in English, this is gonna be very hard. But if you are talking to people in English every day and you're speaking, um, you know, maybe you, like if you're living in an English speaking country and you maybe aren't speaking your language very often at all, or only in phone calls or to, to friends, or if you're watching 
um, movies in, in your own language, um, then if the more so the more time you're spending speaking and listening to English, the faster that process is going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we've actually gone gone over time. Time's just flown by. I didn't realize we we'd gone oh, yeah. ten minutes over. Um, so uh, that's great. We do have a few more questions. What do you think, Tony? Should we save them for next time? Should we quickly do them? I, think um, I mean, I'm okay for, yeah. for a bit longer. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay to stay a little bit longer too. Yeah, uh, that's so, well, so just quickly here, we've got uh, one from Wien again. He says, uh, I talk about learning English in Vietnam. My teacher teaches a lot of grammar. Uh, there are more than 10 grammar in grade seven, and now I'm in grade eight, and I need to learn more. Sometimes I feel tired. So, okay. hmm. Yeah, so grammar... Yeah, it, uh, grammar is a tool. It's a tool for understanding uh, how English is structured. So, um, you know, you, but technically you don't need to know the grammar to be able to speak a language. You know, a five-year-old doesn't really, doesn't know the difference know between the a passive voice and an active voice, you know, and things like that. But they can pro they probably do it because they've just picked it up naturally. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, always remember remember that. Remember that it's a tool, uh, so it should be helpful. Um, you sh but yeah, but I can understand you, you you getting tired of it if you're being forced to learn. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah. So I, I, think I think this is I think this is on. in relation to the question about should we be focusing more on pronunciation? And um, I will say if mm. if you are frustrated with grammar. Pronunciation can be a really great way to kind of go for a break from that, right? Spend some time practicing saying the words that you want to say or listening to how other people say things. Um, that said, you usually learn your pronunciation at the beginning, right? You learn how to pronounce the alphabet when you're learning English, which is not as useful as it necessarily seems like it would be, but because you constantly have to learn how to pronounce new words, but all the sounds are basically there. But once you've learned that, usually they won't continue to teach pronunciation as much. After that, it's all grammar. Um, and so, yeah, that is actually very true. There's way more grammar to learn than there is pronunciation. And so you're going to spend the, if you, if you learn all of English, which nobody learns all of English, but you're going to spend the vast majority of your time learning grammar, not pronunciation. Um, and so that is that is the reality to it. Yeah. And, and as I say, it's a it's a tool yes. and the the grammar that we that we use that you'll that you'll see in, in English language uh, textbooks and things is sort of the most useful. But really, it's the yeah. tip of the iceberg. It is the tip of the iceberg. There's, you know, you, it, it goes on and on and on and on. And it, and it um, for people who just want to be able to express themselves, just pass an exam, just, you know, for most people you don't need to know all of all of grammar it stops to be useful there's diminishing returns as you as, as you learn more and more of it well let me say agree? this uh, so when i said that you're going to be learning grammar for a really long time if you're learning english i don't mean you're going to be memorizing rules okay mm. when you go back to that grade five or that five-year-old who doesn't know that what a passive voice is but can use it they they know the rule on some level the rule is is ingrained in them uh, it's internalized, uh, yeah. but they, they didn't memorize it. They just used it. So the more you learn English, the more you speak English, regardless of whether you're in a classroom memorizing rules, you are learning grammar. Um, right. You're, you're but in, in, that, in that way, a baby learns grammar. In the way, yes, you're internalizing yeah. it. So I don't mean yeah. studying grammar as a thing, but as you're learning English, you're going to learn a ton of grammar. You're not, like, we don't really strongly emphasize long lists of rules to memorize. We mm. emphasize learning a few core rules that explain how everything fits together, and then learning by practicing, learning by by experiencing, learning by letting, uh, by talking to English speakers and asking them to correct you. And slowly over time, your brain will absorb uh, these rules without you ever actually learning them and memorizing them and and even knowing them. But you'll be able to use them, right? Yeah. 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 But you don't have to spend a lot of time studying grammar to be good at English. Yeah. And hopefully you're not getting tested on grammar rules. Hopefully the grammar is being taught as a tool, as a tool for the yeah. for the language, not not something that you get tested on 
to, to know in its own right. Um, so unfortunately, but, that is the way a lot of teachers. Yeah, and I sense that that may be the case. That may be the case here, because uh, he says he's feeling tired of learning grammar. So yeah, may be the case. Anyway, yeah. Another question here from Annabella. Uh, can you explain the difference between uh, wish and hope? Like, I wish I can and I hope I can. Mm -hmm. uh, so this goes back to what you were saying earlier. Um, what well, hypothetical and subjunctive. Hypoth hypothetical and subjunctive, yes. yes. So um, you would say, yeah, I w you wouldn't say I wish I can. You would say I wish I could, yeah. right? That because be, it's subjunctive. Because it's sub subjunctive. Yeah. Um, so kind of, a, a shortcut for subjunctive is it kind of becomes more past-like, even if you're not talking about the past. So, you know, I wish I were instead of I wish I am. Um, mm. I wish I could instead of I wish I can. Yeah. Right. So it becomes but, more past-like. But And it's that's because the, the difference between wish and hope is, is wish is something that's not likely to happen. Yeah. It's a yeah. hypothetical. It's an imaginary. It's, it's a hypothetical. You might get lucky and it might happen, but yeah. it's unlikely. You're not expecting it to. Uh, whereas hope is something, it might still be unlikely, but you do still have a real belief that it could happen. Uh, so, yes. you know, so you, you might, it can happen. yeah, yeah. I wish, or, or you, so you might wish for something that you know is impossible. I wish I could fly like a bird. <laughs> um, that's it's completely impossible for something hmm? that's impossible. No, you, I don't. I would never say. I hope I could. I could. Yeah, I can fly like a bird. Unless I was inventing some jetpack <laughs> <laughs> or something, which you know, some come, some well, that guy. Even if you do. do say it, even if you do say it, you're saying by saying hope instead of wish that you think that this is possible. So you say, I hope, yeah, that in 30 years we can fly like birds, because you're hoping that someone invents something that actually yes. works and is mass marketable. Um, whereas you're when you say wish, yeah you're saying that you recognize that it's not necessarily possible. Whereas when you say mm -hmm. hope, you're, you're specifically saying you think it is possible. Yeah. So a lot of times right. you'll hear people say hope for things that other people will say are impossible. Um, uh, often like relate, related to religious things or specific uh, philosophical ideas uh, because their beliefs show that something is possible. Whereas other people might disagree with them and be like, where are you using the word hope there? That's not, that's not real. So it depends on what you think is possible when you say this. Hmm. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, we might have to make this the last question. Um, actually, before we get into this one, just a quick follow-up to Wins. It says, how, ma how many grammar we need to learn? Now, this is strange. I'm not sure how you're, you're being taught. But... But I would I wouldn't really say that grammar is something that's countable. You you can learn rules. There are yeah, there are how many grammar rules. How many grammar rules? So you might maybe in your curriculum they say, okay, this is the first grammar you need to learn or the first grammar rule. But but grammar in itself doesn't really work like that. You don't really have um, you know it's you, you can't say how many grammar you need to I mean, know. They're not they're not. They're not really countable. There's, there's big things yeah. and there's small things in grammar, and you learn them all in different ways. So, I think. I would say, I, go on. First of all, as a teacher, if you if 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 you if way, the way you're learning grammar is through a class, or if you're, the way you're learning English is through a class, um, you just need to do whatever is going to help you succeed in that class. Because if that's your that's your option, that's how you have available to learn English, then that then that is how you should be learning it. Um, even if it's not the best way, it's the way that you have available, right? But to answer your question in a general sense, what I would say is you have to learn grammar, like study grammar until you can learn without studying the grammar, right? So you, you learn enough about tense by learning the rules until it starts to click for you and you can just go out and talk to people and pick up the way they say things. Does that make mm. sense? Grammar is a tool. You learn the rules until you don't need it anymore. Think of it as like, think of learning yeah. grammar as like training wheels on a bike. You do it yeah. until you can ride without them, right? Yeah. So there's no that's that that point isn't going to be the same for every different person. Some people will continue to learn grammar for a long time because they they struggle to 
just kind of get it, right? Mm. Other people will just learn a few basic rules and then run with it. And it's not yeah. even the same for one person along different topics. Someone might mm. be really good at tense and they don't have a problem with that, but another per uh, but they might when they run into, you know, how to form uh, different kinds of you know compound sentences with conjunctions and this kind of stuff. They might struggle with that, and so they learn a list of rules. Someone with spelling, someone might um, immediately be like, "Oh, I can I can see this word and remember how it's pronounced." Other people like, "No, I need to learn the phonics rules uh, so that I can um, look at a word and 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 guess how it's pronounced." So the rules are there to help you, and you need to learn them until you don't need them anymore to to continue to learn. Would you agree with that, Colin? Yes, absolutely. And and I would say that um, you know the reason that we've been writing this course inside English, it, yeah. we're focusing on tense and sentence structure, yes. and because we feel that that is the most important thing, it, it part part of grammar. Yes. Um, and it's it's something that a lot of people make make mistakes with, even when they get to a quite a high level of fluency they, they continue to make mistakes with tense um and even though and, and a lot of people find say that they find it difficult as well um but there are some some simple logical not simple but logical rules uh that you can that you can follow that aren't necessarily taught so we we're, we're trying to sort of look at the the tenses from a slightly different angle from what you may have learned the, the first time around um so yeah there are there are certain things that are more important in grammar than than others and i would say yeah. that 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 tense is like top of that list um yeah okay now quickly here aj has a uh, some examples uh, that relate to annabella's question from earlier on he says i wish i could marry simona halep the tennis player um uh, I hope I can move to Monaco next year. Um, so yeah, so he's he's acknowledging that it's unlikely, extremely unlikely that he's going to marry Simona Halep, but moving to Monaco is a real possibility. So yeah, great great examples there. Okay, can, now can we also on the topic of how much grammar do I have to learn? Can we answer Annabelle's question real quick? Or Annabella's. Um, so do you think syntax is important and helpful for an English college student like me? So syntax is a part of grammar. So everything that we just said about grammar, that's what that's how we feel about syntax. Um, it's as a university student, I think it is it's very it's especially important um, you do because you're going to use it a lot, right? Yeah. But in terms of learning rules, the the focus should be on you know focus on studying the rules either because it's in your class that you're taking or focus on learning the rules until you don't need to focus on rules in order to continue to learn. Right? Same thing as we said with, with grammar. Yeah. Hmm. Great, okay, then. So last so, question. Yeah, we'll make this the last question from Guru. Uh, hello, how to pronounce two words quickly without losing the tempo of speech had had after the, after the first word you had, uh, you had to open your mouth wide and then your tongue uh, towards the mm. uh, al alveoli to sound. Yeah. So to, had, to the had. You've got to mm. open your mouth. Had, now, had, had, one had, thing you should had, notice had, is you don't had. have to close your mouth between those two words. Had, had. Had, had. had. So I didn't had, really close had. my mouth. So there's no way, no reason you have to had, break your da, um, tempo da, there. Da. Mm. So, yeah, I think in that sentence, the D, the D, so yeah the, the the middle d is sort of softened because it's because of that had 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 oftentimes the last you see had had like in fact uh, this is something i teach when i teach writing uh is if you if you have to say had had if at all possible to contract the first had so instead of she had had she'd mm. had. yeah Always. if had. you can do it avoid saying had had you will occasionally have to do it there's no way around it that's okay it's not wrong but if mm. you ever can contract the first had instead but yeah. the general question of how do so, you because because a lot of people might be thinking why would you ever need to say had had that's the same word twice and it's well, the had is, a, is the yeah exactly of have so yeah had and have is used as an auxiliary verb so in this case the yeah. first had is the auxiliary verb 
yeah. and the second had is the main verb. So this is uh would all would all is is past past the, the perfect past perfect of have yeah. Hmm. yeah. So when it's the auxiliary verb, you you can often contract it. Yes, um, usually. Yeah. So that's but, one way of doing that. But in general, the there are lots of words that when you stick them together, they would be awkward to pronounce. And and mm -hmm. there is a wonderfully simple rule behind the scenes in English uh, that anytime this happens, uh, you soften the sound so that it's not awkward to say. Uh, and, and some of these are have become real rules Con and contractions are an example of those. Uh, that's why you'd say she'd had instead of she had had. Um, one we walked, talked about a few weeks ago was um, finished and it. It changed. Mm. It basically is pronounced finished, finished. it, right? I finished yeah. it. Um, and so that's the rule behind the rule. And again, this is the kind of the inside English approach that like the basic rule, peeling back all the layers and exceptions and like what actually makes sense is when something is awkward to say, you soften it so that it's not awkward to say. Uh, so anytime you find yourself being like, oh, these two words don't go well together, chances are that a native English speaker would soften the the word, that, the, the sound that makes it hard. So yeah. uh, instead of saying had, had, though you can say it, had, had, not a problem, she, you'd say had, had. Um, it's a little bit softer, you know, she had, had, uh, and it's and it makes it so that you don't have to break your tempo. Uh, mm. And that's that's something you I would never be able to take you through all the examples of words that don't go well together and you have to soften it, but I can tell you that's always what's going to happen. Uh, and yeah. so sometimes you have to hear how a, a native speaker says it, but uh, generally speaking, if something seems sounds like it should be too hard to say, you're probably not supposed to say it that way, uh, mm. except if you really complicated and and foreign sounding words like anesthesia and stuff like that. But, yeah. I know that um, my friend Emma, who has the YouTube channel Pronunciation with Emma, has done a lot of uh, videos on this kind of thing. So oh, yeah. if you search for Pronunciation with Emma, you'll find uh, some, some, you may find some good stuff on this. Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, well, that I think brings us to the end um, of today's live stream. Thank you so much for watching. If you are still watching, uh, please give us a thumbs up. That would be really, that would be really great. Uh, I think uh, we've got 26 so far. We've got 30 people watching. So, uh, yeah, some of you haven't given us a thumbs up yet, which uh, is disappointing. <laughs> but no, uh, yes, yeah, so I do really appreciate you watching and um, really looking forward to the next few months as we uh, ramp up our, our production. And do we, we're working really hard on some scripts to for some new videos that will be coming out in January, as well as the course, which is going to be available very soon. Mm -hmm. um, and looking forward to arranging some more, yes, more live streams and getting some guests on um, yes. and, and things like that. So and doing yeah. some, some giveaways. Yep, we're going to be giving away the, the course for free to some some people um, yeah. and some 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 discounts some and. Like we already talked about the Zoom call, so we'll actually get to see some of you and talk to you if you're if you're members on of the site, um, and or of the YouTube channel, and yeah, so lots of exciting things coming. So if you aren't subscribed, uh, make sure you subscribe. Also, if you head on over to the website, you can join the mailing list, so you'll get some more uh, kept, be kept up to date. We don't send a huge <laughs> amount of emails. I haven't sent anything for for literally years. But we will start sending some more stuff soon relating to uh, the 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 new videos that we're going to be coming out with. Absolutely. And if you want to know, uh, we, we do typically uh, do the live stream on Tuesday, but we are probably going to be doing more of those in January. Uh, so go to englishlanguageclub.co.uk slash live. The, the link is in the description, I believe. Um, that will always have our next live stream. Uh, mm. So you'll know when it's going to be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. As soon as we've decided and set up a lot, uh, the next live stream, it will it will appear there. Yeah. So it will give you a, a countdown to, of how many days or weeks or hours. Hopefully it won't be weeks, but days or hours it will be to the live stream. And you can also, you know, what we do there is, is the playlist of the live streams is embedded. So if you ever want to go back and watch through previous live streams, that would be a good place to, to do it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so thank you very much for watching. Yeah. 
Goodbye, and, everyone. Uh, That's what yeah. I need to guru. And we'll see you next time, next week. <laughs>